Okay. So first of all, thank you so much for the introduction. It's a real pleasure to, to be here today and to have the opportunity to speak about the work that I have been doing in the lab of Paula Arlotta during the last years. So I joined the lab of Paula Arlotta because I'm very interested in how a human brain develops, evolves, and malforms in the context of disease. And the project that I'm going to speak to this actually because I'm extremely curious about understanding inter-individual variability, how each of us, we might respond totally different to different stressors. And this is how this model, the model that we call chimeroids, um, was uh, created. So I don't think I need to explain too much in this audience, like why we really need these tractable systems. And as you can see in this, like, silly drawing how our brains are extremely different from other animal models, not only in the structure, but also in the cell types, the circuit, the morphology, and many other features. So uh, we really need these models to start to move forward towards understanding of the specification of the human brain. But of course, for ethical reasons and obvious limited access of human brain development, we really need to have tractable systems. And another very important reason is that if we really wanted to understand complex genetics of neuro neurodevelopmental disease, we really need to use models that mimic the human genetics. So that's how human brain organs can really help us to move forward in this space. And actually, in the lab of Paula Arlotta for many years now, we have been working in generating these very reliable and reproducible models that, are, uh, that they have high fidelity to endogenous tissue. And this pro uh, work was done uh, pioneer in the lab by Georgia Quadrato and followed by Silvia Velasco. And I don't want to entertain too much myself in this moment because everyone understands the process. I think we go from prepotent stem cells and we are going to pattern. In this case, these are guided organoids that the, we are going to guide them towards dorsal telencephalon. And we are to generate from these prepotent stem cells, neural stem cells and neural progenitors that are guided towards cerebral cortex. And at the end of the differentiation process, we are going to have the whole continuum of cell types that we are expecting to have that are derived from the dorsal telencephalon. In the lab, this is the beautiful uh, work of uh, Amanda Kedaglia and Anna Uschiano. We also develop a, a developmental atlas of this, uh, the developmental trajectory of these uh, cortical organoids. And we could say at that moment that actually we are with high fidelity um, uh, mimicking the development of uh, the human brain with high fidelity with endogenous tissue. They use many different lines and many different approaches to be able to make these statements. So in the lab at that moment, we were in a very good moment to actually start to understand um, autism uh, spectrum disorder uh, genes. And then this, this is the work of four very talented postdocs in the lab in which they took these three mutations and by many different techniques, they wanted to answer some of these questions. And I don't want to enter too much into this work, but this is basically the introduction of the chimera project that I want to speak today. You can see this uh, mutation in which you can really see that these three different donors, they have the same phenotype, very early no, on and um, very early on, you can see the increment of these gabaergic cells and the, all the three donors, they have the same phenotype, but you can really see that the penetrance of the phenotype is different. So this really is, uh, we started to think that actually the genetic background might be modulating this, uh, the penetrance of these mutant phenotypes and that we need systems that they can use at a scale to really start to understand human specific variation and how each of us, if we are uh, the same stressor is presented to us, we might respond totally different and how we can do that at a scale. And basically this is how the chimeroid model started, like actually started in the lab. So we had the ambition to really at a scale investigate inter-individual variability. And this is the work that has been done in full collaboration, another postdoc, Irene Faravelli, and Tyler Fates that has been the computation and biologist analyzing the data. So what we wanted to do is actually, we wanted to take a population of donors or people, and then we wanted to put them in the same entity. And this same entity, we call them chimeroid. And this entity is very flexible. You can really choose, depending on your biological question, what do you want to assess? But it's not only flexible in those terms, you can also pick up whatever stressor that you might want to use. So it can be genetic, it can be a drug screening, it can be environmental. The most important thing is we are going to be able to capture how is a specific donor by molecular methods is going to be affected. So the one of the first experiments that we did, and because we were naive and thinking that this was going to be easy, but it was not, we basically took prepotent stem cells of different donors and put them in the same entity. 
a chimeroid, and they look beautiful with the rosettes uh, that Akansa was explaining to you before. But basically, what we see when we do a, a whole, um, low passage whole genome sequencing of census seek, you have here the different donors and the different mixes that we were doing once and another. And then what happens is that there are specific donors that totally take over the culture. And then if you were like taking out this donor because it's highly proliferative, then another donor was taking over. Then you take out this one and then you lose another donor. So it was a system that was not sustainable. And you can imagine you cannot put hundreds of donors in the system because you mainly you are going to lose them. So we need to go around of this system. And then we decided that maybe instead of using pluripotent stem cells that we still don't understand well the features and the characteristics of these cells, maybe we can use cells that we really know very well, that these neural stem cells from the cerebral cortex. We know that the ratio of proliferation is going to be basically maintained by the, the, the developmental speed of the species. So maybe this way we can mix together different donors. And this is actually what we did. We generate our individual organoids from each donor. We did all the patterning individually, but at the end of the patterning period, we were dissociating and reaggregating to be able to make what we call neural stem cell chimeroids that is going to contain the different donors inside, and then we are going to let them mature. So basically, when we do these neural stem cell chimeroids, you can see this by census C, we were able to maintain our donors in the culture, and it was like a very nice to see that even though that we were doing this dissociation reaggregation process, these organoids at one month, they were looking exactly the same as the putative organoids that we are making in the lab with the Velasco protocol. We have our rosettes with SOX2 surrounded by TBR1, uh, TBR and neurons around with very nice polarization in the rosettes. So we were very happy to see that, but what about the cell types that we are generating? So we profiled with this single cell analysis and we were observing that all the cells that we are expecting are three months in these chimeroids, they were actually there. So we were not biasing the different cell types that we were generating. And also what was very, very nice to see is that different mixes, different batches, and all different donors, they were actually making all the cell types in very similar proportions. This is calling for high reproducibility, and this is very important when you are using that tractable systems. You need to be able to mimic the same conditions in all the donors, right? And just to make a note here, this data has not been, has not been batch correct. This data is basically how the data looks. So we didn't use like integration system to be able for the UMAPs to look the same, actually look like that. So you can really see how reliable is this system. So at this moment, we were very ready to use the model for what we wanted to use it, that is to dissect inter-individual variability um, using some neurotoxic triggers. And we chose ethanol because it generates fetal alcoholic spectrum disorder and valproic acid because it's known when you give it to a um, women that are pregnant can develop ASD in the offspring, and both of these um, uh, neurotoxic triggers have, uh, have high phenotypic variability in the clinic. So we really wanted to see if we can see that the different donors are reacting differently. So we basically, we um, we give like these triggers to our organoids for 45 days, we wait 15 days, and then we did the single cell analysis. This is how the data look like. You have the control here, the ethanol and the valproic acid. As you can see, we are not destroying the organoids. The, all the cell types are there. They are very similar to each other. But you can really see, pay attention to one cluster that is appearing in the novel. And this is exactly the same cluster that we were speaking before today with the other paper that we were speaking with the uh, valproic acid that actually is known that can develop ASD, you also make these GABAergic interneurons. So before I was speaking about a, manip a genetic manipulation, and now we are speaking about an exposure of neurotoxic trigger that generates ASD, and both of them are giving us the same phenotype, which was very interesting to, to see. Then we wanted to uh, explore how the data look like, how the different donors are uh, responding to the different triggers. Here we have the control, the ethanol and the valproic acid. You can see how similar among each other. And the first thing that we check is if the proportion of the donors are changing. And we could see very clearly that one specific donor, it was like increasing the amount of the, 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 the cells in the organoid in one specific um, trigger. And then in the other trigger, it was decreasing. So we have a specific effect in the donor, but also a specific effect depending on the treatment. So this was give us the first hint that maybe we are actually affecting the donors in different ways. Then we explored this a little bit more deep. 
we went into only the BPA data and we check cell types that actually are statistically different between control and valproic acid, that are the outer red glias, the intermediate progenitors, and the callosal pyramidal neurons. And if you come with me and then take a look of these two different donors, you can observe that in the case of the outer red glia, CW is making more, more outer red glia and 11A is making less outer red glia. So we can see that donors that are actually growing in the same entity. They have different phenotypes in different directions, but we can also observe that they have different penetrants. And for the first time, we were able to actually detect this, like donors that are reacting differently uh, uh, to a specific trigger. And then we went a little bit deeper, and then we took our data, we pseudo-valved the data, and we analyzed the Euclidean distance between control in circles and um, BPA in triangles and the different colors are the different donors. And then for the first time we were, because if you are more different from your control, your Euclidean distance is going to be longer. And if you are more similar, it's going to be shorter. So in this way, we were able to stratify and categorize our donors in more affected and less affected. And you can really think the potential of this that they can have. You can really stratify patients before your clinical trial. And you can establish these models between animal models and the next stage of a drug treatment, for example. But one little piece of information that I really want to give, and with this I'm going to end, is that if you think about the uh, dysregulated genes in the multi-donor context when you expose with DBPA, you can see like if they grow in multi-donor condition versus if they grow in single donor condition, so without having the environment of a donor donor, the differential gene expression um, structure that you can see is actually the same genes are affected in the uh, CBLU line are the same that are affecting the single donor condition. So this was a very nice result to see because we were a little bit worried of how these different donors are interacting within each other in the structure. So with all this, uh, I think this is the wrap up. I would like to summary my talk in which like, if we really are interested in growing together different donors, uh, because you really want to understand how different uh, donors can react to different perturbations, a good way to go is actually instead of using prepotent stem cells, you can maintain your donor population using neural stem cells. I didn't have time to show this today, but I can tell you, and you can go also to the bioarchive if you are interested, that uh, these multi-donor chimeras are extremely similar, if not the same, to our current organoid model, and they also have a high reliability and fidelity to fetal endogenous tissue. I showed you that we can use this model for individual susceptibility uh, neurotoxic insults, and I give you an example how we can really detect and stratify our donors and uh, depending on how they are affected by the treatment. So with all this, I really would like to thank everyone, like it's very special at the Arlota Lab, Ar uh, Paola Arlota, my supervisor, Irene Farabelli, that has been working with me in uh, full collaboration in this project, everyone involved in the project, everyone in the lab, uh, the funding agencies, and of course, all of you. And I will be very happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Noelia. Um, any questions from the online audience? There are, there are none at the moment, so maybe I'll ask, I'll ask you. I mean, what are your thoughts on characterizing differences between, the, in, between donors? Uh, and where do you think you know where's your interest lie in, in in that aspect of the of the project? You mean like uh, why my interest rely in how the different genetic background yes. can really affect them? So we have like a lot of evidence that actually different we, each of us we are going to react totally different to stressors, That's and right. I think if we really want to go into those those directions, we need systems that we can really put a lot of donors to be able to understand the data because with very few data, you cannot really make big statements. So if you can start to put like hundreds of donors in the same yes. entity, you can really scale up. So that's where like one of the main goals and really starting to understand also for uh, drug screenings and clinical trials, there is a big failure in the brain area. And it's because many times we don't understand how to stratify patients or how to select those patients. So this kind of model really can help in those uh, in this direction. Yeah, thanks. I have one question here. Is there mm -hmm. a maximum number of donor cells you can use in the chimeroids? And do you see cell competition um, or, or just uh, do they mix well? Do, they mix very well. And actually, we did a slice seek to be yeah. able to multiply also the donor in the space. 
and we see that, of course, uh, close to the rosettes, you see some clusters because you have clonal division and it's normal. But once they become neurons, you see like a fair distribution. It's not 100% purely distributed because I think this is also nature and it's normal, but they are fairly distributed. And I think the, the major uh, contingency to how many donors you can put together is if you can use robotics or do, because yeah. it's very time consuming and very like, hand consuming so if you have robots and a, a system that you can really help you with that i think you can go to hundreds uh, of donors like easily thanks very much nolia yeah.